This conference will now be recorded. Good evening and welcome. We are meeting again today on Tuesday, March 29th, 2022, to discuss the ARPA funding uh, subcommittee of the Town Council. Please rise for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of, the United, of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice, for justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, Madam Clerk, are you on the call? Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes. Yep. All right. Can you call roll call, please. Yes. Allenson. Here. Laffin. Oh, okay, got her. Laffin. Here. Tata. Here. Testa. Here. Sandry. Here. Great, thank you. And uh, Mandy Miranda will be on a little later. She had to give a presentation at a school first. Um, is there anybody else from the government that I'm missing? Uh, I see Tim Ryan is on for economic development. All right, so, so we're gonna start with agenda item number one. Well, I guess it's number three. We're gonna look for approval of the minutes from the last meeting as amended, if we could have a motion for that. There were uh, some spelling corrections and things. So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. Item number four, a discussion on the law department memos regarding ARPA. So the memo came out um, at the end of last week. I wanted to put it on here to, to see if anybody had any comments, questions, or concerns, or things that we want to discuss at this level. Doesn't need to be a long conversation. We could have no conversation, that would be good too. Um, but I wanted to put it on uh, to see if there was any conversation that was worth having or if any of the counselors felt there was something that needed to be discussed. Anybody want to go? No? No, uh, Janice had communicated uh, through Chairman Cervoni that she was possibly going to be able to, to make it tonight. Um, we do have uh, our standing ARPA meeting, uh, I'm sorry, agenda item at the next regular town council meeting, which is not next week because there's an extra week this month, extra Tuesday. Uh, so it'll be the second week in Tuesday. Uh, whatever we do tonight will be reported to or recommend, maybe we'll have recommendations to the council for approval in that second week. Uh, the consultant is supposed to be there, so that's a good time for us to button up our stuff. If we need to meet again next week, um, we did not uh, discuss that prior, um, but that, that could be floated out there. Uh, we do have an extra week before the meeting to, to get something else done, although I'm hoping that we can just kind of keep moving along. Uh, any other questions or comments or concerns about the memo? I mean, I kind of, I made some comments in the paper that was just in general, um, there's, we're, everybody's still trying to figure out the April 30th deadline slash date. That's a reporting deadline from my reading. Um, I don't know that anything legally has to be determined by then. Um, it's definitely worth confirming, uh, which we are working on, but we still have time uh, to do all of that. And uh, Councilor Tata thinks there might be an ordinance meeting. Yes, uh, we can meet after if we need to. Um, Mr. Brzezinski, you had said you wanted to make comments. Do they pertain to the law department memo since that is this agenda item or do they fit into either the draft applications or the general catch-all we leave at the end? It's on the applications. Okay, all right. We'll come back around to you then. Um, Edward B, if you could say your name and address for the record.
Okay. At Bradley to Hampton Trail. Uh, the question, I thought Janice would be here, but that's okay. The I, question. You made me trying to come here. I don't know yet, um, but it's, yeah, nonetheless. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it, it's related yeah. to, uh, I guess, uh, the legal side of uh, the ARPA. Uh, yep. We know that the uh, federal government has allocated $5.3 billion uh, to the states. Uh, if I recall, I think 13.1 million uh, is going to the town of Wallingford. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I would, and there's a lot of talk about the 5.3 billion uh, when it comes to uh, uh, fraud uh, and, uh, you know, uh, on that money that's uh, gone uh, to the states. And I wanted to ask Janice, uh, or maybe, I don't know, your consultant, how do they plan on monitoring the 13.1 million that's being allocated to the town for fraud and inappropriate use. That's that's a general question. I don't yeah. know if any of you people uh, can answer that. I, I just know there are regular reportings that are required. The first of which is due April 30th. Um, it, it, the final ruling on ARPA from the Treasury Department uh, becomes effective April 1st. Um, it's like 171 pages, so it's something ridiculous. So I did not read it all. Um, but yeah, that would be that would be a great question uh, for her if she pops on, um, or definitely by the time um, we have the consultant for the full council. Right. The, the other question I have is a question on the profit in uh, non-profit uh, agencies. Can any of that money be used for executive salaries, licensing rights? I know some of these uh, non-profits do have executives up and above where their normal money goes for worthwhile uh, programs, but I'm wondering if any of that money can go towards salary or licensing fees. I believe the United Way, uh, the uh, uh, subdivisions, the, the local divisions of United Way, I believe they have to pay licensing fees to the National United Way. So maybe someone from United Way can answer that question. Well, I know from the council perspective, um, all of our discussion to this point has been in favor of uh, leaning more towards actually new projects or programs um, with a consideration that a nonprofit could apply for a restitution, I guess. Um, but that would all go before a committee or a decision-making group that, on whether the money could be spent on that. I, I don't, there's been no discussion. I can't imagine any counselor being okay with, with that as far as uh, spending the money. And I don't think the nonprofits, at least the ones that have participated in our discussions thus far um, would be bold enough or dumb enough to to apply and, and ask to use the money for that. Um, we're really looking to put the this money back into the communities uh, as much as possible. Yeah, but is there a way to monitor that? Uh, you know, and again, we, we get into the legal aspect uh, of it to make sure that that money isn't finding its way up up to the top for licensing fees, uh, salaries for executives, things like that. I know, I'm pretty sure uh, Masters Mama, I believe is totally a uh, volunteer. I don't believe there's any money uh, that I know of 
uh, that's paid uh, into salaries for people uh, down there. Yeah, I don't. Um, I think we. I mean, we'll have. <clears throat> excuse me. We'll have um, not an audit, but we'll have accounting responsibilities. You know, they'll have to show us how the money was spent. Um, going forward um, and that's probably more of an administrative function um, but I I just can't imagine that sure so. now I just raised those points uh, yeah, no. you know, right. to everyone and just uh, from a knowledge standpoint thank you thank you people are raising their hand do you think you have a better answer than the one I gave that's not going to take like 45 minutes no people are nodding okay shaking their heads no good okay the last two meetings went like four hours. I'm just looking to keep things, to keep us a little more focused than uh, than previously. Um, any other questions? Um, so any other questions from the public? We're gonna come back, uh, Councilor Tessa has questions, or comments. Councilor Tessa, you might as well go. Thank you. We, um, on the subject of the legal memos we received, they they're helpful in some ways but they they reflect a pattern that comes up even in our own discussions and so on and so forth and that they drift by that i mean i have my prime my primary concern right now is and this is almost a yes or no are we under a deadline that um, requires us to make a determination as to how much of our funding we are going to devote to municipal services. So I asked that because at the last council meeting, I had a discussion with Mr. Farrell and he seemed to indicate to me that yes, we are. And if we, pick up on a dollar amount that's the dollar amount and you can't exceed it nor can you use if you don't reach it you can't use the money for other things and that alarmed me yeah and um because then it, it then it it, it, it it that that impacts all the discussions we've been having everybody has their own way they want to this to go uh, but whoever, regardless of what it is, all of our uh, desires, if you will, for what a plan would be, are impacted by this. And what happens is, and in the memo we see this, what happens is it seems to say maybe. Yeah. And then, I, yeah. And then it starts to define what government services might be. And then so on and so on and so i don't want to hear that i know what government services are we've talked about revenue replacement we talk about we, we can't get a number from the re administration on revenue loss but what's the point of that in re re reality what is the actual pragmatically what's the point of even getting that number yeah. my understanding is that it would be a figure that you would then identify so that you could then use arpa funds to for relief to whatever that is so i'll point out the administration showed no interest in that anyway they're not they made it clear they're not interested in using the money for anything but businesses and nonprofits anyway yeah so it doesn't surprise me that they haven't given us that number um the other alternative is well rather than calculate all those numbers and another answer is if you calculate your revenue loss are you then tied to that you could then go you know what i'm just going to go with the standard deduction and and that says you can you could identify a number up to 10 million dollars not 10 up to 10 just like on your taxes forget all the deductions just go with the standard and it would say you can pick a number up to 10 for municipal services but we we end up getting caught up in the discussions about well what's a municipal service um we could spend a whole evening talking about, um, well, when we talk about giving money to nonprofits, 
What about all of the agencies that receive some funding, uh, funding, funny, some funding through our budget? You know, we give the Little League 3,000, we give this, I mean, I'm saying, if you can identify that you have over time spent money on public agencies, whatever they may be, with your budget, does that mean when you talk about spending on municipal services, you can include that in that in that package? Yeah. We've also talked about all these agencies being able to appeal to us separately. So I when I you know when I came up with my proposal for divvying it up last time, I just was looking at the big picture. X business, Y nonprofits, Z municipal services. But clearly, there's such a crossover between municipal services and the nonprofit and the public agencies because we fund some of them to a certain degree at some point. But there was all this and all, but all that stuff clouds it up. We could get caught up in all of that. We still haven't received this answer that is critical, in my opinion, to how we proceed. And that is. Do we or do we not need to commit to a number before this April deadline? And if we got no other answer from our consultant or our legal department, that's the one we need. Yeah. And I will close, and I have more to say, of course, as always, but I will close with this. I am extremely concerned, which is real close to being extremely upset, that this matter has not been addressed. And I I don't want to make accusations, but I've been here long enough that, you know, sounds like a duck, it's a duck. I'm I'm really upset because I think that it's intentional. Because when we hear from the administration, the the uh, um, the priorities being put forth, and by the administration, frankly, they're being represented by Mr. Ryan, whom I respect, the business community, if you will, the EDC. They make it clear that they don't think money should be spent on anything that could be considered a municipal service. We talk about projects and all those things. Well, that's all folds on the municipal services. So we find ourselves in a position where if we don't identify an amount by a certain date, oh, well, too bad, too late. And that's really got me frustrated. Um, and by the same token, because we find ourselves potentially backed into a corner, then it, that is the type of thing that inspires myself and other of my colleagues to say, oh, 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 we got to make it. Oh, oh, then picking a number out of the, grabbing a number that may not even be necessary, but because we're afraid we're going to lose the option of spending money on capital projects and municipal services, we've got to throw a number down, you know, and um, the only relief I sense in that is that if we do so, there is that concept I mentioned earlier that because so many nonprofits have been received money from the town, we won't be as restricted as I thought we would be in that, oh no, we have to spend all this money on brick and mortar. No, it's municipal services. We could use it for all sorts of things. Um, we, we know that our own youth service bureau is gonna be critical as a conduit and uh, but to find ourselves in a position where we may not be able to commit any money to any of that, um, I'm very concerned. So, uh, as I said two weeks ago, before we talk about anything, we better know, we better have an answer to this. I think, uh, I agree. <clears throat> before we commit that, money. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for indulging me. But there's, uh, I want all my colleagues to, to take all that in. Because that's where we're at right now. Yeah. And I didn't intentionally Great. mean to insult anybody. So I know I'm going to get responses, but so be it. Thank you.
Uh, I agree. Uh, I did talk to the mayor last week. Um, and, and so my, my response, I'm gonna, I don't have any hard concrete answers, neither did he. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of respond with, with my take on where I think all this is end up going. Um, so the final rule uh, came out in February, but it takes effective uh, effect April 1st or something like that. I think part of the confusion is originally none of it could be spent on government related anything. Um, so the final rule kind of changed that and this uh, this this deduction that you're claiming or whatever um, that amount you're supposed to the deduction is a separate it's like how much did we lose in revenue right and so the mayor threw out less than two million dollars or about two million dollars um, I believe they're still trying to figure it out you have to follow a very specific equation to get to that and the equation I guess is so convoluted in a sense within the same final rule they allow smaller, minis smaller municipalities of uh, less than 50,000 people, which we are, to just give a number without having to account for it because they recognize it could be so laborious to calculate, figure out, and be so time consuming. Um, I There's a few things I understand the administration is looking for. One, they're looking for a better definition, uh, and they're in communications with Treasury and whatever, on what government services are. Um, my take on it was it's like the operations, because originally it said that uh, um, this money could not be spent on operations. So I think that that dollar amount could be an exception towards government operations. I don't think it precludes government projects or community projects. Um, this would just be if money was going to be spent on government ops from the last year to kind of make up for it. Um, that's my take. I could be wrong. Uh, that's why I'm not, maybe I'm not worried because I, I feel confident that that's the way it's going to shake out. Um, so the, the mayor has a concern about the number, giving the number, because once it's out there and stated and done, then that's it. And then he wants to make sure that it's as accurate or as good as it can be um, so that there isn't some other further step where the treasury comes back and says, oh, you already claimed it was two. You can't say it was three now or whatever. Um, we can claim 10. We can claim up to 10. Um, so the second thing or the third thing, I don't know what number we're on, uh, the administration is looking for is what can that 10 be, be spent on, just like you asked. Um, can we spend it? Can we give it to nonprofits? Can we give it to businesses as a function of government? Because if so, if we know that's true and it doesn't have to stay in government, we'll probably just claim the 10 just to keep it easy. Um, but if that government, if that money is limited to having to be spent on government services, so what are government services, um, that's where they're apprehensive to, to, to pick the number. Uh, and I, I do understand they are probably trying to calculate what the actual number is according to the treasury standards. Um, and they, they could take the easy way out, but they don't wanna do that if it's gonna bind how we spend the money. So we still have a month to, to figure that out. Um, but I think there is a difference between government services and government projects regardless. Um, so if, if we so choose, we could, I think even if we claim the money for government services, there are, we could still allocate money towards government projects. Um, I think the more the larger concern is that we wouldn't be able to give any to nonprofits or businesses. Um, but it's all kind of a shell game in the end, anyway. I guess, right? Like we could just give money to nonprofits and organizations like we do in our general budget. But then it gets messy and recurring, and you you know you got to account for it with revenue and one time and all that. Um, are there any? Counselors that want to respond. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Ryan would like to respond uh, as you were addressed. So please, sir. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I just wanted to uh, address some of uh, Mr. Tessa's comments. And I think Mr. Tessa and I think more alike than not. So it's not that economic development is against funding municipal projects, it, it's that we don't want to do it at the expense of the need in the business community and in the nonprofit community. So we have said consistently that we need to determine what the need is 
in the, in the business community, nonprofits and households before we can allocate money towards the uh, municipal projects. So, and I also wanna share that um, I share a frustration with Mr. Testa in that this late in the game, it's a year into this and we are not getting clear signals, clear enough signals from the United States Treasury to make a determination as to whether we can place a number in a municipal project bucket and, and just as a placeholder, for example, and then use that number. Um, I think if we put something in there, it seems we're committed, but it's unclear and it's, it's frustrating at this juncture to have something as fundamental and something that drives the use of the money to the degree that that does be unanswered. So Mr. Test, I, I share your frustration. And if I knew the answer, I'd share it with you. If the legal department had a clear answer, they'd share it too. I don't think anybody's gaming anything. I really don't. And that's not the way I play. I, I am the advocate for the business, but we all have constituencies to satisfy. And, and we understand that. I want to make sure that the business community is satisfied. I know that the non non-for-profit community, I support their uh, quest as well. Uh, and to me, the uh, community projects come into play when the other two entities have been satisfied. However, I understand again that everybody has a constituency to satisfy. So for example, last meeting it was 40% for business, 30% for nonprofit, 30% allocated. If there was a 10% allocation for business as a place and for uh, community projects as a placeholder, I honestly would have no issue with that because I think there's a constituency there that needs to be satisfied and I'm okay with it. So I just wanted to clarify that. So Vinny, I, I think more like you do than you think. Um, um, and that's, I guess that's all I have to say for the time being is that, you know, the frustration is, is common because the unknowns at this point are, are to some degree hamstringing us. That's why we have said consistently from the get-go, let's get the applications into the marketplace so we can determine the need and let the need drive the division and, and the allocation of the money. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Short, did you want to speak or you just want to let your comments stay in the chat? And then, yeah. okay. and uh, Robert, I'm guessing that is Mr. Gross. You are correct. A um, couple quick questions. A uh, quick qu uh, question is, I pretty much know the answer here, but have you asked the consultant what the deadline is? They're, that's who they're. They're going back and forth with, and I think they're trying to to iron well, all that out. So I was not. I was not given a concrete answer, and and that may be part of the reason why they weren't able to show tonight. I don't know. Going back uh, and forth. I mean, well, I'm, confused. I'm confused on going back and forth. There are some deadlines. The deadline is 12 31 24. Um, but I agree. that is the deadline. They you can decide, you can decide tonight simply to allocate a million dollars for not for profits, a million dollars for business, and a million dollars for the town. Use up that money in six months and say, okay, who needs more money? And pass out the money that way. You don't have any applications. Why you're allocating money now, I don't understand. What you should be doing, and I'm not speaking what you should do, but my opinion is you should be finding out what the need is and go with it from there. And you should be asking the consultant this. this that's the basic question. Um, to somebody's point, the money, the way the money could be used was changed. Always from the start, it could be used for the government. Government always had a say in how this money was to be used if you read the original rules. That's why you'll see right from the beginning, some towns such as Merritt and so forth bought a fire truck right off the bat with this money because they could use it. You, and New Haven bought cameras. They spent $12 million on cameras. Um, you could use it. There are certain There were certain criteria you could use to use it for municipalities. It has now opened up further than it was before. You could use it for ballparks, linear trails, et cetera, right from the start. Anything that was classified as outdoor activity for the betterment of the community was able to be used at from since the beginning. The equation to figure out how the 2%, the, the, the amount, it's not a hard equation. It's you take three years of your budget, you take the multiplier effect of what the increase in the budget was every year, or you take 5.2%. Those are the two numbers. All you need is three years worth of budget, the aggregate total of those numbers times the 5.2%, and you're done. 
Um, so that's that was pretty easy to figure out. It's not a, a, a the government didn't make it that difficult. Um, let's see here. I mean, th these are things that uh, they do advise you that you should not be using this money for reoccurring charges, because when the money's gone, you're the town's going to be holding the bag to pay for this money. So that's just one thing on how you're using that money for. Um, I, I got, but it, this just seems that you guys are just making it much harder than it should be. Most towns are done with their money already and div divvied it up, or uh, divvied up a portion of their money so at least some things can be started already. As I think Mr. Ryan just said, you're into this a year now, literally a year, and there hasn't been one dollar. Well, the only money allocated is for a consultant who can't give you an answer. So I, I think he can give you an answer. I don't think the answer has been asked properly. Thank you. Thanks. And that uh, I was the counselor that made the comment. And yes, thank you for clarifying my statement. There were uh, specific things the government could spend the money on, and um, other municipalities started doing otherwise anyway. So they they just wrote it all into a make it okay. And I, I think there's just an adjustment as part of that. Um, Mrs. Harlow, you got like three minutes because you used the 17 minutes to talk about, but not as the meeting started. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have a couple of comments. So first of all, yes, it's true that there are nonprofits in town that receive monies from the town. And they receive monies from the towns because they deliver services that are needed for people in our town. That should not disqualify them for a, applying for funding for this for funds for this purpose. This is an ARPA grant, and this is meant to help people to recover from the uh, impacts of the pandemic. When we open this process to nonprofits, nonprofits will submit proposals to address a need that came up because of the pandemic. And when you receive that, you receive a grant application, and this is to answer some of the questions of Mr. Edward. Um, a nonprofit, and that is where I have been talking about the, the rules have to be very clear, the criteria has to be clear, the evaluation process has to be very clear. When a nonprofit submits an application, it provides in great level of detail what they are proposing, what program they are planning to, uh, to, to carry out. They present a budget. So all of those things are analyzed and those who review those grant applications decide if it's something that is fundable and if something that we need in our community or not. So the grant proposals that we will receive will be to address a need that came up from the nonprofits. And the last thing that I would like to say is that nonprofits are businesses as well. They are mission driven. They are not profit driven, but when you have a nonprofit, you have expenses just like any other business, so you can deliver your service. You have a occupancy, you have staff, you have insurance, you have all kinds of expenses just like any other type of insurance of, of business. So when the nonprofits will apply in their grant applications, they will apply and they will, their budget will include the expenses that that nonprofit will incur to be able to deliver that program that is proposing. And the other questions about the United Way, I will be happy if you reach out to me, I will be happy to talk to you about that offline because I only have three minutes because I spent seven on empanadas, so I'm done. But I'll be right. happy to, to answer those United Way questions. Any other questions from the public that want to speak it for the record? Uh, just a reminder that the, the chat uh, can be used to communicate kind of operation stuff or you can make comment for people to read, but it won't actually end up in the record. So if you need it, something on the record, um, just make sure that you, you say you want to speak now. Uh, so we are waiting to hear back from legal. Um, hopefully soon. I know they are still trying to find out all their answers. Um, for in the meantime, do we think we're all set on the legal memo and we want to move to the drafts? Yes, no, okay. Um, sorry, one moment. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. All right. 
So with all that's been said, I've heard several comments that say this deadline doesn't exist as I understand it, as I was, was as it was explained to me by a town attorney. Um, and all along I've been saying, I love the idea of starting to allocate money and, uh, you know, determining need and giving it up and have the ability to shift and adjust. I'm all over that. I think it's a great idea. I just want to reiterate this. If I am misunderstanding what this deadline I talk about is, then I will stand corrected. I didn't find it. It was ex it was identified to me. Yeah. In a certain way. So that's so if I we, said the same thing when I when I was talking to the administration. I so said we, I, I yeah. Yeah. We think that if we think that you know we have a little we do have a little time, but I will simply reiterate this. There's nothing more important right now to, to know for a fact than that. Right, what we do, and uh, we can argue or discuss for hours what's whether a capital project is a municipal expenditure. Of course it is. What's a municipal service, all that stuff. We can argue about that all day long, but we need to get this answer. And um, I will leave it at that. If we're going to hold off for now and go on, that's fine. But for me, that is a critical uh, determination that uh, we need to make uh, to fulfill our obligations. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next. I, I will uh, quickly answer the question I, I was able to read then uh, while Councilor Tesla was speaking from Lillian. Uh, as a consultant performed or facilitated collaborative meetings with uh, nonprofits and community. Now, I know the consultant with the government um, that the stage was to, to initially develop the draft applications, which is the next agenda item. Um, and then our, our community, our, ourselves, will address the needs based on those applications. And the consultant can or cannot be involved in that, depending on what we determine or desire. Um, but there was not a general meeting. Um, it was just how do we get to the next step? The next step is where we decide how to spend the money, part of how to decide how to spend the money are these draft applications. Uh, so I do apologize, they were not included in the original packet. Um, they were done very late in the hour over the weekend. Um, and it should it should be something we're all more or less aware of if we've been paying attention and been watching these meetings. It, these are just kind of the final uh, tightened up drafts. If, um, if anybody has any questions or comments, I'll highlight the the, the red lines, I mean, they're literally red. Um, we removed the line that uh, determined how large a business was. The line says businesses must have 25 or fewer full-time equivalent employees. Um, I did do research into full-time equivalent. Uh, that is a term. Um, if you have four employees that work 10 hours a week, that equals one full-time equivalent. So. Um, you could have a, a larger pool of 100 people working there, but it's all about the equivalency. Um, so I didn't feel the need then to define or, or change that anywhere else. We added a couple if no's, why nots, like did you apply for money, did you get money, why didn't you apply for money, things like that. And uh, same thing for the nonprofits. We basically mirrored the restitution part, uh, the restitution document for the nonprofits to the business document. And, and then we um, included that entire program request form, um, which there was a, a program or project. Is that the, the correction? It was program or project um, request form for nonprofits to develop a program going forward instead of just um, getting restitution for money lost. Now, if we could focus this next part on uh, on the, the document or if, if people are, are of course gonna have general questions, but does anybody have any major issues with with the writing, with the draft document? I try to send it out to the, the counselors, I sent it out to the nonprofits that I've seen here. Uh, I think, I hope I, I didn't miss anybody that I should have missed, should not have missed. Um, it's really, again, 
um, I think enough people received it that if something was missed that we could point it out or somebody caught it. Um, Councilor Tata is great at catching that kind of stuff. So does anybody see anything in these draft documents? My goal would be that we would recommend this to move to the council for the next full council meeting for that council to decide on, on consideration. Um, when I was on the Board of Education, we used to do consensus votes and it didn't necessarily mean that you were in favor of the item as much as it was you were move, looking to move it to for a full decision from the council. Um, that's how I would interpret any of this conversation tonight, any of this debate, any of these votes, um, because we are not a deciding body. It's the full council that's the deciding body. This would be, in my dream, we lock down these applications tonight. We recommend them that they'll show up on the first council meeting of, in April with a consultant present and uh, we can make a motion and then they can end up in the portal. He said he needed like a one to two week lead time to get them online and in the portal and then businesses and nonprofits could be applying. That's what I'm hoping for to do tonight. Um, and then we do have the catch all agenda item at the end, don't forget, because I know people probably have other comments and stuff to say. So if we can keep all the following comments on the on the actual draft of the application or things we might have missed. If somebody really needs the a copy of the draft application, let me know in the message or uh, send me a private message with your email address if you want to do it that way. And while people are talking, I will quickly try to send it out. I apologize that, um, if I missed anybody. All right, who wants to go first? We're going to start with the counselors. Councilor Tata, did you want to go first? Karen, thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of things. And like I said in previous meetings, I think we all know I'm not in favor of these applications going out first. I think this is the last step, but while we're looking at them, I just want to point out um, a few things that I think may be missing. Um, on number 25, which is in red, I think there's a few more things we may want to ask about there, um, specifically tax credits, um, employee retention credit, um, if any employees or owners received unemployment compensation, either state and or federal. Um, so that would probably all fall under 25 because I think that we're not including enough. Um, it says et cetera, but I want to make want, sure that. want the businesses to indicate how, mon, how many of their employees received unemployment benefits. Is that what you're saying? No, no. I'm saying the on number 25. Yep. Um, so there's a list of examples, PPP loans, EIDL loans, restaurant revitalization grants, et cetera. I think there's um, there were many other programs that I think we should be mentioning there. So um, the employee retention credit, for example, um, unemployment compensation for, because it says, did you apply? So some business owners um, did receive unemployment compensation, um, state and or federal. I think that should maybe be mentioned there also. Um, any other tax credits they received. Um, like I said, the employee retention credit is ongoing, so they're, they still could be applying for that or receiving that currently. Um, and then just as a whole, I think we may want to ask if employees were laid off um, and also the I think where this is really lacking and I looked up a lot of other towns applications and many of them are online so they're pretty easy to find but we're not asking for tax documentation um, we're not asking for tax returns we're not asking for um, P&L statements balance sheets so we can't where we're just asking this is it's <laughs> when you compare this to other towns applications this is very basic and very um there's really no backup so i think to include um tax returns financial statements um maybe bank statements even would be a good idea so that we can verify um and then the only other comment would be under so the page that's titled Town of Wallingford American Rescue Plan Program Request Form, um, on the second page of that, it says, has your organization applied and or received ARPA or any other federal COVID relief funding? 
And if so, please provide details. I would suggest that it says federal or state or local. Um, Cause I think we want to know besides just federal cause the state did also have a lot of programs. Um, so we could maybe just include federal, state or local. What number just, was that? Um, there's no page number on it, but it's um, oh, the, the line number. There is no line number on it. That This is on, um, it's the document at the end. It says Town of Wallingford American Rescue Plan Program Request Form. There's no numbers on it. Oh, for the nonprofits? Is that where you are? Yes. Yeah, it's like, it's at the back. It's after number 13. It's the next two page. It's the next three pages, actually. It's the very top line. So it says your organization applies and receive ARPA or any other federal COVID relief funding. So you think it should be more specific to include state and local as well, not just the federal. Okay. Would you feel yeah, better if we just if we just slash the federal line? Well, we didn't like that because all the money came from the federal government. But it's okay if you want to go to that level. All the COVID well, relief money came from the federal government, but it's fine to put it at that level. There were other municipalities ahead of us that gave, and I think that's probably what she's looking for. Did did well, Maryland? Yeah. Well, there were also there were state programs also, so I think we it's wanted that. It's fine to the, from the federal government, but it's fine. Well, I mean, we can keep that. The, it's not the problem. Wait to be called on. She's still so explaining. Um, yeah. So so you want to you want to be more specific versus just removing federal. You'd rather specify. The programs or do you want to remove federal and keep it vague in general we can just remove federal that's fine um but there were state programs also so i just want to make sure that you know if we're only saying federal and then somebody received uh you know any state relief i want to make sure that we know about that also so um yeah i'm, I'm good with just removing federal and that appears twice actually um it's on that next page also it says arpa and or federal covid 19 relief funding so that, That's yeah, fine. just removing federal is fine. All right, if nobody has any objection to that, we'll just we do that too. Okay. Um, the, I mean, I think, I don't think we, I mean, other people can, can jump in and let me know if they disagree. I think the et cetera covers the, the concern for the listing, all the other things. Um, otherwise, if we, if the list is too long, then it is kind of limiting us to the existence of the list. If the list is short with an et cetera, it's kind of saying, these are examples, is there anything like it? If the list is 20 items long and we miss items number 21 through 25, people think they're getting away from something. I'd rather keep it shorter than longer. Yeah, and um, that's okay. I just, I just want, again, we don't know who, we don't know who's looking at these, who's judging these, who's grading them, however it's going to be handled because we haven't really just that no. and so i just want to make sure that um whoever's looking at them or, or whoever's applying is realizing there were there were programs besides these um yeah. and i i also i think maybe this might be a separate line but the, i know i mentioned the unemployment i um i don't know if we want to add a line about that um or if nobody's interested in in knowing that um i just I think it'd be too tough to to figure out everybody's unemployment, like all their employees. I don't know. Yep, yeah, and the only the only reason I uh, this is specific to nonprofits, though. Or are we trying to blanket this for businesses too? I think we're we're talking about all three right now. Are the the business and nonprofit applications? Yep, that number twenty five is under business. Uh, I'm looking at the business one right now. Um, number twenty five under business on the business application. Um, it's still on so, that. Yeah. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, I think we all know there were, um, the federal government was given the extra $500 for unemployment. And in some cases, um, people were making more with the unemployment than they were what they would normally be making. And so um, if we're trying to find, if we're trying to see who already benefited from any of these programs, I think that might be an important one to um, to put in there. But also as far as the employees, if, if employees were laid off, um, that would directly affect the uh, 
profit, the net profit, the the revenues. And so I think that's an important piece of information. But um, again, if we're not looking at financial statements and we're not calculating revenue, then I guess it's a little bit less relevant. But if that is something people are interested in, I know I would like to see, um, you know, tax returns or at the very least, you know, financial statements. Um, and if we are going to look at that, then I think that that would be an important thing to look at. But again, those are just my thoughts. So I don't know if anyone else is interested in that or not, but just figured I'd um, throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, my interpretation anyway was that um, this, these were more qualifying applications. Like, did you qualify to be considered? And then um, I know it might, you know, how much do you need or whatever will be figured out, but in the final decision. So we may determine, we may need to, to have that judge group that uh, come back first and say like, oh, I think we need, you know, X, Y, and Z um, for the tax returns and stuff like that. But I, I'm okay application wise, the initial round, um, not looking for tax return stuff necessarily. Um, but that may, I don't want to preclude us from being able to ask for that in the, in the next phase where it's the actual like granting of the documents, like if they get past the first round. Um, that's just my take. Um, Cause I don't want to make it too cumbersome to, to even apply. And I don't want to have people hand in all this work or do all this work. Um, and then we're going to look at them. Oh, you didn't, we're not giving you any money anyway. You didn't even get through five of the 25 requirements. Um, but if some, if I, if I'm outvoted on that, it's, that's okay too. Um, Mr. Ryan, you are next. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to address the issue about tax returns. So on the initial application that EDC had submitted, we did uh, have tax returns as a requested document. It was the recommendation of the consultant that we not do that because of the um, privacy issues, because of the information that's on the tax return uh, that we would need to redact in, terms, in order to protect the businesses. Um, so what we did, and just responding to Ms. Stata, because I totally agree that there needs to be validation. All right, we wanna, we wanna make sure as stewards of this money that is going to where it's supposed to be going and people are not using this to double dip or using it as a, you know, as a, as a way to gain. All right, so uh, number 18 on the business application uh, says gross revenue reported to tax authorities for year ending December 31, 2019. That was submitted, frankly, in, in lieu of asking for the entire tax return. And of course, there's that station on the first page that says that anything that you submit that is inaccurate, you're subject to uh, consequence. Now, one thing that I'm gonna ask, because it was added on my uh, copy, but I don't see it here on the copy that we're looking at as a committee tonight, that your committee is looking at tonight, is I would, on number 19, or let's put it, let's call it 18A, and that would be gross revenue reported to tax authorities for year ending December 30, 31st, 2020. The EDC's position is that, you know, COVID impact is a cumulative event. 2019's pre-COVID. All right, impact in 2020 is going to be the delta between the 2019 and the 2020 return. The impact between in, in 2021 is the difference between the 2019 return and the 2021 return. You know, in some cases, businesses started to recover in 2021. If we just measure 2019 to 2021, 2020 in most cases was a much more negatively impactful year and we're skipping over some of the impact. So, what we would like to see, and again, I, we, the consultant agreed to put it in. I'm really disappointed and surprised that it's not in here, but that we would be asking for gross revenues for years ending 2019. That becomes our baseline. 2020, we can measure impact as a delta, um, and 2021 versus 2019. And then you've got the accumulative impact of both tax years against your, your baseline. So totally agree that there needs to be validation there, but um, rightly or wrongly, that was the consultant's recommendation not to collect the full tax return just because of the sanctity of the issue and the privacy of the issues that are that are within that tax return. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, just go back to um, under business eligibility and when it comes to 
small businesses being defined. We've got it redlined out, must have 25 or fewer full-time equivalents. I know uh, Councilman Zandri, apologies, has um, um, stated before, and, and I agree, 25 is low. Um, you know, we're, we're very comfortable with the EDC going to 50 to 60. Um, the um, American Rescue Plan Toolkit that was released in, in version 2.0 last week from the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities has in there a definition of small business as 500 employees or less. So I would, I would submit that um, we, we have to put a number on it. Uh, we shouldn't leave it open-ended because we would be in violation of the, uh, uh, of the ARPA reg. But I, I still think um, anything north of, you know, say 60 employees, uh, what will happen is uh, typically larger businesses are, 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 are uh, they're more sophisticated, they're better capitalized, they, they do more strategic planning for, for, you know, typical downturns in the economy. Certainly this is not a typical downturn, but what I would submit is that they're, they're better positioned to absorb some of their losses more so than small businesses. And the bigger the pool of businesses, if you get up into, you know, north of 60 employees, for example, that pool becomes so large, what we're doing is we're diluting the efforts and the, or excuse me, the benefit that we can give to the smaller businesses who frankly we think are more likely to need it because typically they're, they're uh, not as well capitalized. So um, I, would, I would ask you to consider putting a parameter on it and certainly raising it from 25 we're quite comfortable with. Uh, that's just a number we started with a long time ago, but you know, 55, 60, I'm good there, but I would encourage you not to go much higher than that for the reasons I just stated. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So uh, when the counselors are making their comments, um, just can you throw in a, a comment on whether you object to including the 2020 Delta in between 18 and 19? Um, that is, so we asked for 2019 and we asked for 2021. Mr. Ryan suggested as we also include 2020. Uh, and then the 60 employee limit changing from 25 to 60 versus striking the whole thing out. Just kind of throw in your comment. We'll draft it. We don't need to make a big deal out of it. Uh, but Councillor uh, Tata has a response. Thank you. Um, I understand Ms. what Mr. Ryan's saying about the um, 18 and 19 trying to address the gross revenue without the tax returns. Um, I guess what my, my concern is, and the reason why I brought up the unemployment is so just using the gross revenue figure, I don't think is indicative of where a business stands. I think the more important figure um, would be your your net and your profit because if if it, um, if a business laid off all their employees, obviously you know personnel is your biggest expense. And if you lay off all your employees, but your revenues go down, you still could have had a profit. Even so, you basically what I'm trying to say is your your gross revenues can go down, but your profit could increase. You could you could raise your fees, you could raise the fees to your services, and so your gross revenues could be down, but your profit has gone up. And so by only looking at the gross revenue, I think we're not getting a full picture of the business and how they're doing. And that's why I suggested we add some sort of financial statements or um, I, I just don't think this, the information on these applications is complete enough to determine how business is doing. So, um, I mean, I guess I can understand why we don't want to do the tax returns, but I, but I also, I thought that the consultant was collecting tax returns from other municipalities that he's working with. So uh, we can ask him next week. I think, you know, I might ask him at our next, our meeting next week, because I'm, I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere that he was doing that. So I'm not sure why he would have told us um, not to do that. So that's something we can maybe look into. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, we're gonna go through now the counselors sort of Tessa first, Sandry, and then Allenson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we need to, I'm not comfortable with having a, a good understanding of what, what we believe are valid uh, losses to re you know what are we willing to reimburse what are we literally looking to give businesses and why um 
I said this before. We, you know, we know we know what happened. We know some businesses were not a business, and that's horrible. We know a lot of businesses did had you know had a rough time making it through, um, but they got through. They got through because they had money from the government for uh, to help pay bills, to help pay payroll, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna, and yeah, we're gonna get we, we're gonna ask for all that information. What did you receive so far? What did you use it for? Um, so here we are. Now we what are we really what are we willing to reimburse? And more importantly, what are they going to do with the money? That's paramount in my mind. You know, if your employees were able to collect unemployment, business owners were able to collect unemployment. Yes, revenue went down. Yes, you, you barely were able to keep the, the, the doors open. But you're open now. I, I, if this sounds cold, I'm really sorry. I don't mean it to be. But I can't tell you how many how many people contact me um, with concerns that I'm trying to express uh, because you know I'm not anti-business. I've never been in my years in service. So uh, if I say things that sound harsh, I apologize. But let's get to, to the facts. You're open. You're open. Your business is open. You've weathered the storm. Now you're going to apply to us for money. What are you going to do with the money? Because if somebody is looking to replenish their bank account, I'm not on board with that. If someone lost income and is like, man, I had to use up all my savings. So you got to give me 10 grand so I can rebuild that. I'm not on board with that. Everybody suffered. What are we willing to reimburse and what are they going to do with the money? If And I've said all along, if, if there are businesses that are still having a hard time keeping up with their bills, they have backed up bills, they have debts, they have loans they received that weren't forgiven, those to me are the easy checkoffs because that's going to help them re further recover. Actually, it's going to help them recover, period. But those businesses that have weathered this, we keep talking about how we have to help them. Well, what are we going to help them to do? And if we don't find a way to, to answer those questions, I'm really uncomfortable. Um, and I haven't had any, man, I don't think we've ever really, we said, let's look at what the law allows for. But philosophically, what do we think? What's the EDC's position on this? What's our position on this? What are the people reviewing these that are going to approve these applications think? So give me your tax returns. Your revenue went down. This went down. This is that. Blah, blah, blah. You know, now what? You're asking me for $200,000. For what? Do you need that to continue to be a viable business operation? Have you gone into debt? Did you miss an opportunity to that you there was investments you had to make that you couldn't? Machinery was down. You could not repair machinery. You needed to invest in whatever it was and you couldn't because your revenue, you lost that revenue and you, you, you were only able to stay open. So if you said, this is what the pandemic did to me and if you can reimburse me for that, then I can get back on track. Those are the kind of things individually make sense to me. But when someone says we were barely able to keep the door open, our employees suffered, we, but people collected, you collected. Did you have to use your savings? Yeah, we all did. And are you gonna ask for money so that you can replenish that? Are you gonna ask for money for lost income? Who's gonna get it? Are you going to divvy it up among your existing employees? All those answer questions should be answered. Um, and because in the end, we're going to be weighing these things against investments in programs, community uh, development activities that 
will help us weather the next one or provide more opportunities for our youth to have things to do, address the very real psychological problems that so many of our kids and others experienced, you know, people that are going to need counseling and further assistance. Those are things, ongoing expenses that our youth service bureau and our serv service agencies are going to be looking at. So if we run short on being able to do those kind of things because we sent out so much money to businesses, we better have a good answer that those expenditures were truly legitimate. And, you know, and I, I just think that's our responsibility. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zandrick. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, you know, I got to echo a lot of the sentiment that that uh, Councillor Tessa just kind of went through. You know, I, and again, I'm going to also emphasize what he said as far as, you know, some of this is going to sound bad or anti-business, and it couldn't be further from the truth, but. There, there's a lot of scrutiny that has to be paved with what we're doing. Now, before I kind of get into my own particulars on this, I just want to ask a couple of quick questions just to kind of let the rest of my thoughts collect in my head. The, there's a discussion point around, you know, removing the 25, but kind of capping it at 60. And see, again, I, I, don't necessarily like that idea so but before i comment fully on that i'm just going to ask and if tom if you know that's great you can kind of set me straight but if we had business a with 70 people requesting money for one particular reason and uh and uh, another business with 100 employees requesting it for b could we reject either one without cause and what i mean by that is maybe we didn't whoever makes the decision i don't mean we but they, if they're looking at the financials and don't like something, or they don't feel like the paperwork is filled out well, or they, if we allow one company to get, one business to get funds and another to not, what what is the, do we have to put in a clarifying reason why, or can we say, you know, be based on the parameters listed that it didn't, it didn't meet conditions and you're not going to get anything. Does it have to be clear and delineated or can we say yes to one company and no to another? I mean, I, if we want a, a more experienced answer from the consultant, uh, we can do that. But my, uh, my take has always been that if we just decide no for one reason or another, that's it. Maybe, maybe it's just need. Maybe everybody else needed it more than you. That has always been my understanding. And if the government can't function that way, then I, that's a totally different thing. But that has been my understanding. All right, that, so, so I'm, I'm going to make a note. We'll, say sorry. Yeah, okay. So we're going to have the consultant at the next council meeting, correct? Yes. I, I'll, I'm going to follow up with that one there. All right, so now I'm going to kind of kind of, kind of offer my thoughts where I'm at. So here's here's, here's why I think the financial statements are important. Um, and it maybe it's not a full-blown full requirement as we go out the door. Um, you know, maybe it's something we do. As, as a second round or third round, as Maria Harlow outlined, you know, tax returns can be collected on a second step basis. Just out, just a generic comment here. If a business used to be open six days a week, and now they're open five days a week, and their original customer base doesn't gravitate to the five remaining days, and I'm just gonna use Monday as an example. If they, they go out to eat on a Monday, I'll use restaurants. If they go out to eat on a Monday, and business A used to be open on Monday and they they are now closed because that's just a new business decision for them. They've, they've decided to close an additional day, staff, whatever the argument might be. The individual that goes out to eat, if they, if they are super loyal to the business, they're gonna come back another day of the week. But if the idea was Monday's my day to go out, now they're gonna go elsewhere. So my argument is if a majority of the people are, are along that premise, a business that chooses to reduce their hours by 17% might be reducing their profit 
they're they're you know they're they're profit by 17 percent because they're closed an additional day that would show up on financials and it's not completely accurate because they're making a business decision to take an additional day off whether that's for personal reasons health reasons staffing reasons i don't know there there are parameters here that we need to look at and and some of them are, are not mix and match and that's why i think it's important to get a better understanding of what are what are the issues with with the business i'll use hair salons as an example and allow me allow me the little bit of a consideration that i I'm, I'm only speaking in layman's terms but if but if a if a hair salon operates 60 hours a week and they're still operating 60 hours a week today but because of new new requirements or you know uh you know new requirements for health concerns their appointments are taking longer there's nothing they can do even if they and if they've only got four chairs in the place and they're always active all the time same amount of hours but the amount of people they can put through their their business is diminished because appointments take longer that's a direct result of changes affecting their bottom line they're fully staffed every employee returned they just can't take as many clients because of sanitation afterwards and whatever the story might be there's a lot of things that that we we this whole process needs to take under consideration how did people's businesses change how are they negatively impacted still today because of changes and how can we maybe help them if if there's a process that we could help afford to that business by giving them some money and they make changes to the inside of the store to put in a fifth chair. I don't, I don't know. So again, these are the things I think are important to look at. P how people operate their business was was affected by the pandemic, and how do we get them back to where they were? Um, again, I'm going to echo with Councillor Testis some of his sentiments regarding we we've lost some businesses. Some of these businesses are never going to come back. Hypothetically speaking, if a business owner was burning up their savings through the pandemic trying to keep their business open and then it just totally failed they, they put it away they got rid of it and then they went to work for some corporation in in a similar field because they've got all that expertise they're out a business they probably sold their hardware for dimes on the dollar and all their personal investment is gone in theory they should be able to come in and say look i wiped out two hundred thousand dollars worth of value but i'm ineligible because my business is gone now and now i'm working for abc big corp because it was the only thing i could do to keep from losing my house so there's a lot of factors here this is why this is taking so long because we're trying to get it right and um my my concern too with limiting the businesses based on size is because uh, you know, again, if we can reject for any reason, parameter, listen, you know, whatever, why are we taking someone that has 100 employees and saying, sorry, no, they may have been impacted worse. They may have tried to keep running. They may have tried to keep paying everybody. Sure, they, they may have gotten some, some of the PPP money and paid people, but, you know, even though they were bringing in that money and paying their employees, and if they weren't selling as much, if they couldn't produce as much, supply chain issues they're not making as much profit but they didn't go underwater but the business uh the business wasn't as profitable this is why i go back to you know maybe the financial statements are are, are really something we need to look at um i i i don't want to belabor this too much more and i don't want to overload it much more i want to move the the process forward i think i think it's i think it's if this is going to sound this is going to sound funny i think it's fantastic that we're so concerned about getting it right that we're taking our time with this but but at the same time i think the concern needs to be doing something and i don't mean just do something tomorrow to get something done but we need to move a part of this forward this is why i was encouraged with some of the conversation of let's let's earmark some of the money for and go with it now and leave some of it on reserve if we need to um, if we've got to make an, an, um, an allocation to what we might use in the town and then lock it into the town to use for municipal stuff, that's, that's fine. 
if, if we've got to come down to a deadline time and do it. But I, I want to see us move forward because I'm concerned that we're still talking about it, not doing something about it. And um, I, I, I want to see some of this activity get started. Um, so that's, that's all I've got for right now. Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We're going to go next to Councillor Allenson. Um, hello. Uh, so I just wanted to say a couple of things about, um, you know, unemployment being a consideration. Um, unemployment is usually there for people to make themselves whole. I understand that in some cases, um, people made more money on unemployment than they did employed. Um, and while we can all feel whatever way we want to about it, if you didn't qualify for that, you're probably pretty lucky um, because you didn't have to worry about whether or not the unemployment would still continue to be there at the end of the day, um, whether you might get denied one week or um, whether you'd have complications. So um, unemployment costs go to a person. They reimburse you for your housing and your personal expenses, which, you know, if we're trying to live within our means, that's what it's designed to cover. Doesn't It, it doesn't reimburse people for losses to their business, um, i.e. the cost of rent, utilities, where they still have to turn the lights on and pay for a space that all of their stuff is in um, for their building, for their business. Um, so I don't wanna get too far down the rabbit hole of trying to over account on this. Um, I'm also worried about taking too much information in from both a data privacy perspective in the um, within the application itself and I'm also worried about it from a an ease of use perspective um, when we're the, the application is designed to be kind of a way that we can over get an overview of the ask um, when we get to the part where we're um, at the consideration stage, so some some businesses, nonprofits, individuals will not uh, will not be will not qualify per the application process. We don't need to have all of their information. Um, that is a responsibility that we would have to take on. Um, a privacy responsibility as people. Um, in addition to the consulting firm would have to have, you know, would have privacy concerns there. Um, so many things being redacted and all of that um, information may make it very daunting for, um, I'm going to say businesses, but I mean everybody, businesses, nonprofits, individuals. It will make the application process very hard. Um, I don't think, because I'm always the person who says we're here to do hard things, and if you want money, then you should do a hard thing. I just don't think that as a first step, it's um, we should require an, a vast amount of information. Um, I think that we should ask all the questions, um, but when we're going through the process of allocating, that's when I think we would go through the verification process that what we've essentially been um, that what we've been told in the first part of the process is backed up by um, all of the documentation, whether it's utility bills, back rent, tax returns, whatever relevant information they want to uh, they want to um, provide in order to back up their claim, um, and then. I think that's really I, I think that's really the only things that I wanted to recommend. So I am for collecting the information as a second step because I do think that we have a responsibility to know 
fact that we're giving this we're giving money out to businesses that haven't necessarily made a comeback in 2021 you know from uh, a loss in 2022 so i do think we need to be responsible about the way we allocate but i don't think as part of the application we need to go deeper than to ask for the honesty um of in in the first step which is you know, 2019, 2020, 2021 uh, revenue um, reporting. So, thank you. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna uh, shoot down a, a list that's been growing here. We're gonna start with uh, Mr. Berdinsky. Um, thanks, Tom. Um, this may be one of the few times I, I say this, but uh, something that Tim Ryan said, I agree with. Um, include the 2020 data. I mean, the more information everybody gets, I, I think the better. I think the better it is. Um, there has not been, in, in my opinion, anyone in these meetings that have exclusively represented the public interest in the sense of public trust in the system. And you only get a, you know, one chance to make a first impression. And if public trust in the system is important, uh, every stage, every step, every decision can, can be seen through the lens of, does this enhance public trust or does it not? And, you know, I have heard uh, well, there's a first phase and a second phase and a third phase, and we can forego the information now, but we don't know, and the council hasn't decided what those phases are uh, and who's going to be calling the shots ultimately. And if so much weight is put on, well, that'll be dealt with later. We know, got to know who's going to be doing it later. That's got to be decided upon. Names, you know, who are they? Uh, and do, do the selections are made by whom and how does that enhance uh, the public trust in the system or not? Now, um, speaking of the public trust, we circle back to tax returns. Um, the objection I heard was that businesses are afraid of uh, their privacy being compromised. I think that was the only reason. And merely because the consultant says, oh, no, you know, you don't need tax returns because the businesses might be offended. Merely because the consultant says it doesn't sanitize the decision. If the businesses are worried about their privacies, there's two ways of handling that. One is those tax returns were deemed to be private and confidential under the Freedom Information Act. If we need an opinion, we get an opinion but the state of Connecticut has approved economic development applications while hiding, doesn't help the public trust, but they did it, hiding the financials behind the application. Uh, the other thing is to tell businesses, look, if you're looking for $100,000 in community money, uh, you're gonna have to understand the community needs to know what's going on. So the more, the more that information is withheld, decisions are made behind closed doors, the more decisions are going to be made by people who we don't know about. Uh, and, they, and the government is telling um, the taxpayers of Wallingford, your community projects are being jeopardized because you need to trust us that we're going to have a fair, open, transparent, equitable assessment of these business applications. Um, I want to get to, a, I'm pivoting a little bit to another, to another topic, but the first major one, what what decisions are you making that are enhanced or uh, the public trust or, or otherwise? But the broader question I think that many of you have been wrestling with is um, which kind of businesses are you trying to help and does your application target those kinds of businesses uh, in, the best, in the best possible way? Here's what I mean. Uh, the U.S. Department of the Treasury uh, in its final rule, which you all got, it was part of your backup to, I think, a council meeting a, a couple of meetings ago. So I'm not doing my own research here and, you know, uh, uh, picking and choosing what I would choose to discuss. It's in your backup. And one of the, um, one of the slides 
said overview, key objectives of this funding, referring to ARPA fundings. Oh, and by the way, in case it wasn't clear, I'm only commenting on business applications. I have no comment whatsoever tonight on the nonprofit applications. So I'm only talking about business applications. But the uh, Fed um, said that the coronavirus state and local federal recovery funds, uh, you know, are 350 billion, so on and so forth. But the key object objectives of this funding are to fight the pandemic and support families and businesses struggling, that's the key word, with its public health and economic impacts. Not my word, it's the Fed. They need to be struggling and it's in the present tense. Are they struggling or are they not? And how do you know? And what information have you culled, have you asked for uh, to determine whether or not they're struggling or do you not care if they're struggling? And that's the divide. And because I don't, I don't want to just ask a question and then drop it and walk away, I, I'd like to hear. So Tom, you kind of know my style. I'm sure going to circle back to you in a minute and say, Tom, what do you think? Uh, did the business? Yeah, I know. I see that little half smile. There. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not your show tonight. <laughs> is it? Do you need those businesses to to be struggling? And 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 how do you know? Now, the harm done to the community by giving a dollar to a business that didn't you didn't intend to get is that the other causes are jeopardized. So every dollar that goes to a business that let's say is not struggling. When your decision is to limit this to struggling business, every dollar that goes to a non-struggling business hurts another cause, non-profits or, or community services. So the issue is to what degree are you going to be careful, thorough, and stringent, and filter out those struggling businesses from non-struggling business? Or is the decision like one we heard when this process first started? And that was, it was at a council meeting, I think it was in the summer, don't have the date, don't have the minutes, but it was clear uh, the administration made a comment and at least one counselor made a comment that we are not targeting struggling businesses. We're struggling all businesses that had a loss. They don't have to be struggling. Someone said in public record, a loss is a loss. The struggle part was not relevant. And that thinking is still prevalent, I fear, you know, among the decision makers at town hall, you don't have to struggle, even though the Fed says you're supposed to struggle. In another slide that all of you got, um, there was more guidance. This is a summary. Uh, it says part of the funding is to be used to, uh, for assistance to small businesses and to assess which small businesses were impacted, recipients, that's the town. The town may consider, among other things, financial insecurity and i don't think there's anything in the applications that filters out those that are financially secure currently and those that are financially insecure yet the fed says those are two criteria that, that you're supposed to uh, that you're supposed to use so what do you want to do i mean that's a choice and that choice that choice i think needs to be on the record explicit to give guidance to everyone down the line uh, the, uh, uh, to to understand the criteria for applications. A, you have to struggle. Uh, yeah, and B, you have to struggle because that's that's the point. And you've got to submit documentation and uh, whatever it may be to show you're struggling. And I just want to give you two examples, and then I'll and then I'll wrap up uh, that may illustrate um, what I am what I am talking about. And a couple of the counselors mentioned this, you know, the distinction between a revenue, a revenue drop and a profit drop, a huge difference. Yet the application only looks for revenue drop. So this is a quickie. So, uh, so my example, and pick up a pencil and do the math, because this is a this is serious stuff. This this could swing the applications by millions. Just this distinction, the decision you make tonight to let this application go as is has consequences for millions of dollars that potentially could go to businesses that are not struggling. If that's what you want, full steam ahead. But here's the example. A business shows a revenue drop of let's say 250 and the owner takes a reduced salary, a reduced salary from 200,000 a year to 125, a $75,000 cut. But he puts in his application, 
and he puts in his application for the full 200, uh, for the full 250. Well, should he get the 250? Because that was a revenue drop. Should the businesses get the grant? And under the current application, because we're talking application, does the business get the grant? Tom, I'm going to ask if you agree with me. Under the current application form, they get the grant because they're eligible. They had a revenue loss. It dropped by 250. Other losses, you know, the salary, or you know, but they get that 250 in a revenue loss, and they're eligible. Now there's a tension. Well, you're eligible, but we have another committee that's going to say maybe you're not. So have confidence in the application process. But we deem you eligible. We're going to phase two, and and the criteria for phase two are not expressed. They're not written down. They're not explained. We know nothing about it. Here's another one. Business has a revenue loss of two hundred thousand, but during the pandemic, the business cuts its expenses by fifty thousand. So. A loss of profit, let's say, was 150, but the revenue drop was 200. Should they get the full 200,000 revenue loss when the loss of profit was only 150? Tom, what do you think? We're talking about the, as I said in the beginning, the operational draft changes that we want to make here that we've been talking about now for like three or four meetings. So yep. there's something specific you think that would be more helpful versus the knee, uh, the eligible application versus the need consideration. Um, that's, I'm all, I'm all ears. I'm I all ears. My mentality all along and why I've been against uh, a lot, the, the government project portion was that this was supposed to help struggling businesses and people, uh, the restaurant owners, uh, when I go out and every time I walk into the restaurant, uh, you know, they come over and ask me when are the applications going to be out, things like that. Those are the people that I want to help. Uh, so that's that's my answer. Um, I totally get what you're saying. And the people that are struggling because they took a no salary versus the guy that took uh, still made 125, only 75 less than the year before, which was a great year. I get it. That's different. Um, if you think that there's a question we can include in this, I'm all for throwing that on there uh, Look, for us to talk about or putting it before the council. But I'm just trying to keep yeah. us going because we, we've been bogged down, down in these philosophical discussions for weeks now, four hour meetings and so on. So I just want to keep it going. Yeah, I understand. And I think what you're saying, I've come too late. It's too late to discuss those kinds of things. And I can't well, you've do been paying attention. I know you've been paying attention. I can't do your so, job for you. I can't reset uh, if we have the no, I mean we can add one right now. Like it's not it's not that you're too late. Let me let me finish. I mean sure. let me finish. You got a couple of choices. One choice is to ask the consultant to I believe in management by objectives is the work. Ask the consultant for eight measures, let's say. It could be five, could be 10. That could be added to the application. Don't rely on a layman, Mike Berdinsky. I'm not saying that. I'm raising a concept which is never going to go away, this, this, this problem. It's not going to happen. Even though you think it's late in the game, it really, it really is not. It's never too late to be careful and thorough and protect the public trust. Ask the consultant. I'm just trying to get us to this. Eight measures to put in front of you by this next council meeting. And the way that could eight measures that that filter out the struggling from the non-struggling that goes in the app that goes in the application how that would work someone in town hall picks up a phone tomorrow gets to the hold of the consultant and relays that desire i don't think it's ever going to happen but i'm just saying it's very easy to do uh time is not the barrier here it's the will follow up with an email and at your next council meeting you would have, my example, eight different measures to find out if a business is struggling or not, and tax returns are part of that. Probably just a small part of that, but that's certainly one way of, of doing that. So you wanted my suggestion? That's my suggestion. Rest from the consultant ideas on how to filter this out. Uh, and the other idea is certainly the tax returns of balance sheets over the three years, profit and loss statements over the three years, and the business owners and the business owners uh, draw. Um, 
on the uh, on, on the nonprofit end, I'm, I, I'm done now with the businesses and I've overstayed my welcome, I know. But on the nonprofit end, um, if we find that um, in several months that the allocation to the nonprofits has been inadequate for one reason or another, additional money can be drawn from the government services category because I think it was Benny Testa who, who said we've been funding not all nonprofits but many but the precedent is there we have traditionally provided services to nonprofits therefore ARPA money can be used to bolster nonprofits so that is a reason to protect the government services category over and above what I've um, heard tonight. Hey, I thank you all um, for your for your patience and understanding, Tom, especially you. Um, and uh, I'm going to sign off unless you've got something for me. And then I'll... No, do you know how to end uh, comments without like doing your whole sign off spiel, or is that just like you just like click into a natural? You can't even help it. It's in the DNA, and uh, it's, no, uh, well, it's been, yeah, no, you do it well. It's just it's just process a warning, and it comes to you. I mean, I no. so the, uh, no, and and so my and the two way to the game comment. My my uh, in the very beginning, the the only way that that factors in is that we kind of decided that uh, or agreed that this was sort of these were the qualifying, and that there was a another kind of phase that was the direction and in an effort to keep this process going while we figure the other stuff out, we could get the application ready and up online. So your your preference or your idea is it's got to be all done out of the gate. And I'm not even saying I'm against it, just that it is it will slow us down more versus getting something up on the portal now. You know, um, I understand, it makes perfect sense. I, I, I thought I was done, but I can't. Um, the excuse that we've run out of time to do it right, that's my no, excuse. Yeah. Hold on, you, we, we can't go back now we're too far down a bad road and it's too late to turn around and review and revise and even get on record the philosophy of the town of Wallingford struggling versus non-struggling. It's too late to even discuss that. I hear you and as I say on TV, I'll accept that as your final answer, I guess. Well, but I'm not saying we can't go back. I said, it's, if we're so, gonna do that, it's just gonna take more time, that's all. And, I, and I'm not one that believes April 30th is a, is a hard deadline. I know some other people might, or people well, are trying to find it more. But. The, the federal rules say that it's an irrevocable deadline to make the election. The, no, the government services part, yeah. Right. And they are getting clarification. Um, and that was something the, ad, the the mayor was adamant about was right. was what you had just said. Can he might consider that a government service is to give it to nonprofits because we do that as part of our normal budget, uh, but he wants to make sure that that qualifies and that we're not gonna get dinged for later. Thank you. Thank you. Are you gonna stay around and watch the rest of the show or are you just, you're out now? You're... But thank you for putting the tie back on because I know Maria loves ties. I put it back on. Looks without good. Him. Looks good. All right. Thank you, sir. Counselor Tata. Did you just refer to this as a show? Responses. Hmm. Was that Councilor Tata or Testa? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I just interjected briefly because oh. I think I think Councilor Lappin just referred to this as a show. He asked Mr. Burks is going to stay and watch the rest of the show. So oh, I'll, wow. I'll, I thought that was great. I'm, I'm yeah. going away now. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. I think you're his favorite teacher. All right, go ahead. The humor. Sorry, Councilor. Sure. I, um... In response to um, Councillor Testa's and Councillor Zandri's comments um, earlier before Mr. Verdinsky was speaking, but but then Mr. Verdinsky's comments played right into this also. Um, I think, you know, I know we've been looking at the applications for a long time. I know, you know, I've, I've made it very clear that I'm not in favor of these applications from day one, but, um, you know, as I was looking at them and I'm saying, you know, there's some things we can do to tweak it. I think some things are lacking. But now we're here tonight, and I think I'm not the only one who has concerns about this anymore. I think that, um, you know, there's the 
the argument is coming out about who is deciding who's getting the money, uh, how are we identifying a business that's struggling or not struggling, how do we decide, uh, you know, once these go out, how do we decide who qualifies, who doesn't, and I think there's a very simple solution to all of this, and it's, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but when I, when I keep bringing up capital projects, I didn't necessarily mean projects that the government specifically needs to do, such as, um, I, don't, I don't know, something that, you know, a department needs. But what we could do to avoid this entire issue, to avoid the picking winners and losers, to avoid, uh, you know, kind of a paperwork debacle, <clears throat> is we can still divvy it up into the three components. So we can still have nonprofits. We can still decide how much money we would like to go to the nonprofits. We can still have businesses and how much money we would like to go to the business community. And then we can still have maybe, I don't know what we want to call it, general uh, capital projects or general government um, projects and things for the town as a whole might fall into that. So I think rather than having individual applications come in, we can look at projects that would benefit those groups specifically, and they could maybe get together. So I know the nonprofits have said, have told us how they meet, um, they meet at the library, they all talk, they try to assess what needs are. If they agree on several projects that would help the town as a whole, or, or help, you know, their specific nonprofits, then might that be easier than having individuals submit these applications and we're not really sure how we're determining who's getting what. So for example, I spoke to um, one, I spoke to a couple of the nonprofits last week, actually. Um, one of them, and I don't, I don't think he would, he would mind if I say it, but I spoke to um, somebody from the Boys and Girls Club. And he said, yeah, you know, one of the ideas that we had was for a, a summer camp project because um, a lot of the adolescents were affected by COVID and if we could get this program up and running this might be something that could help the community um, you know things like that so that would be something that could help under the nonprofit project umbrella so for the businesses for example we know that outdoor dining became a huge thing during COVID because it had to be out of necessity but then everybody really liked it and wanted to continue it and so maybe we throw some money into that so that we can upgrade our outdoor dining areas and make them more welcoming. And so that would help the businesses, but it's not just giving money to a specific business and, um, you know, picking, well, this business got the money and this business didn't because this one fit, you know, some vague criteria. And um, so it would still help the businesses, but it's a project that everybody could get behind. Um, and then same thing, obviously, for you know, just the general capital projects. I know the pool has come up, I know splash pads, online bill pay, things like that, that maybe don't directly help the nonprofits or businesses, but they help the town as a whole and things that people have really said, you know, I would like to use some of this money for something like that. So I know you said it's, you know, late in the game to change the strategy, but I think um, I think it's it's coming out now, the more and more we're getting into these applications that they're, I think we're going to run into problems with them down the road. And to avoid that whole problem, I'm wondering if it's a better strategy to still keep these three buckets that we've kind of identified, but just go about it in a different way and maybe talk to the full council and um, just put these applications aside and see how everyone feels about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miranda. Thank you for coming. I know I, I warned everybody that you were coming late from another engagement. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> can there, can everybody hear me? I'm having yeah. issues too with my camera, so I apologize. Um, well, I was actually going to talk about the individual household piece. I was looking at, you know, I was in agreement with the application that's here. Um, I was definitely under, you know, in from what everybody's saying about this being like the initial application to take a look at. Um, almost for that wall, for that ARPA, does it meet ARPA approval, you know, through the consultant? Uh, and my understanding is that then it gets um, sent back to a committee 
that would would be formed. Now, when it comes to individuals and households, you know, based what I'm looking at, and actually um, Councilman Dandry mentioned it. Um, I mean, one of those things would be I could see falling under an individual household application is if there was a business owner who now the business was shut down and that person has now moved on, right? Moved on to maybe to another position somewhere, having to utilize their savings uh, to make ends meet. Um, and now, you know, that person could apply as an individual instead of as a small business uh, small business owner. I think that would fit. I don't know. I mean, I would have to ask the consultant, but I think that would fit. And then the committee, you know, I'm thinking about, just sitting here thinking about the committee and, and what that would even look like, even on the nonprofit end. You know, people on this call and in past calls, we know about confidentiality and we know, um, we know how that works and, you know, the seriousness of it. And when people are bringing forth those documents at that, at that later stage, because that's what it is, that committee is then asking for the backup documentation so that we could check it off and make sure, like, like again, all those I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. And having that with a, a group of people that understand that piece that this is this is confidential we're not you know we're not talking about you with other groups of people or you know that sort of thing it's saying within this committee um because it's, it's a serious topic for people and if people are taking the time to fill these applications out it's important for them i mean there's a reason why they're filling these applications out some people aren't going to you know, they're because they moved. They maybe they have moved on, and they've they found other avenues. Um, they've gotten into other other employment, or you know, other things have changed. They've just moved on from it. But then there's there are people that yes are going to apply, and they're gonna they're gonna take a look at you know their situation and and, and put forth a, a very good effort because there are going to be there's are so many steps involved in this. I mean, that's how I see it. The other piece of it when you're dealing with individuals and households. It's not that everybody who's applying is necessarily going to get ARPA funding. It may be a situation where, you know what, there's another pool of money somewhere that makes more sense, right? So if it's, you know, involving rent or if it's involving um, utilities, it might make more sense for them to, you know, be involved in like our matching payment program, you know, with the electric division. Um, you know, or something through um, like new opportunities or Operation Fuel or you know things like that, where that makes more sense because that that's what exists, and that would be our first. I, in my mind, that would be our first line of like, okay, this is what we're going to do for people. The ARPA money, in my mind, with individuals and households, comes into play when you're, when, and I think I've said this before, when you've, you're going into your savings, right, to help basic living you're you're going into the college fund because now you're you know you're, you've been unemployed and yes you're getting unemployment but it's not covering everything right so now you're you know you're using that maybe somebody was ill and you're now you're dealing with the hospital bills you know there's not funding for that so those and it's all COVID related funeral expenses you know, things of the, that nature that you don't, there's not pots of money for, that we can't steer someone else into another direction. So a lot of this individual household stuff, I could see if a family's reaching out looking for assistance, we might be able to help them too with other types of assistance, not just ARPA. It's in addition to. So, I mean, that's just my, my thoughts on the matter. But thank you. No, thank you very much, um, Mr. Gross. I had to unmute myself. Sorry about that. I want to keep myself muted. Okay. Um, just a couple other benefits. I, I agree with Ms. Miranda there um, that there are a ton of programs available 
or there are many programs available, uh, and there have been many programs available, um, that the ARPA money should be the last resort for any of this. Um, just some of the things that are available. Um, well, one thing to, to Councillor Zandri, he was talking about revenue losses and so forth. The government's compensating for that. They came up with a program last year, no, wait, 2020. It's called the Employee, Employee Retention Act. And it goes through 20 and 21. And it, it, it's explicit for businesses, any size, as long as you have a revenue loss. It, and it has to fit, there's a, there's a formula for it. And you qualify for up to $10,000 per employee. So there are these programs out there to make people whole. Health insurance has been a big thing under this ARPA plan that nobody's talked about. If you've lost your job, if you're self-employed, if you've had insurance and were self-employed before this, if your income is, I think, under 400,000, um, you qualify for health insurance at a reduced rate, and some of it's down to zero. You can make almost $100,000 and pay like $100 a, a month for health insurance for two people. Um, it's it's really a program that's out there that should be aware that it's still going. It's out there now. If you lose your, lost your job today, you can get you can sign up for that program um, as long as you're non Medicaid and so forth like that. Um, Mr. Brzezinski was spot on with a lot of those things. I I I, I would hope that the that the money, as I've advocated a long time, some of it sees the town. Most towns that are giving money to businesses. And there are not a lot of towns that are giving money to businesses, but the ones that do are capping it. 5,000, 10,000, they're not giving an unlimited open checkbook. And there's very few towns giving it to uh, individuals at all. Um, because of the programs that are set up, you might wanna help a, a um, master's manor or something like that to make sure people are eating because there's all these other programs that are out there. Uh, there's the renter's assistance programs. There was uh, what do you call it, uh, for your mortgage payments and all, there were all these programs out there to help you through the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, if you died of COVID, they even paid for your funeral. I mean, it was, uh, there was no, uh, you know, the government really stepped up. So I just hope that you look at all those things and income, you, you really, many towns, if they are asking for the, even for the small businesses, for the five ten thousand dollar amounts, they're asking for they're asking for a tax return, because as Miss Miranda said, towns are capable of keeping things confidential. That you know they deal in that all the time. The police deal in confidentiality, social services deals in confidentiality, the school system deals in confidentiality. So uh, I'm sure they're capable of handling it. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Uh, Mr. Ryan, you are next. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to address um, something that was mentioned earlier, a couple of things. Uh, you know, the part of the frustration in dealing with, with the ARPA funding is the inconsistencies and different interpretations within the document itself. Uh, we, we know we're living with one in terms of trying to determine uh, the amount of funding for community projects, but it was mentioned earlier, Mr. Brodinsky uh, stressed that um, and, and I'll read from the eligible uses section of the document, you know, uh, fight the pandemic and support families and businesses struggling with its public health and economic impacts. He stressed that he felt that means present tense. So it's only those that are struggling now. Uh, with four pages deeper into the document, it says assistance to small businesses. Funding can be provided to small businesses that experienced a negative economic impact past tense, okay? So I don't wanna get hung up. I, my, my interpretation is um, that it is businesses who have been impacted. It has mentioned that in any number of cases. So I just wanna clarify from, from my line of sight, and I realize it's just one line of sight, that it is not a, is a singularly a present tense scenario. These are businesses who have been impacted. I'll read again. Uh, funding can be provided to small businesses that experienced a negative economic impact or disproportionate impact caused by the pandemic. The type of enumerated projects is dependent on whether the businesses, whether the business was impacted or 
disproportionately impacted, past tense. So it is past, it is present. It is not just present. Um, furthermore, in, in, uh, in the early, earlier commentary, it was suggested that someone suggested, and I didn't hear anybody else mention it other than myself, so I want to correct something that, um, that the um, uh, UHY advisors recommended we not ask for tax returns because the businesses would be uncomfortable with that. I never said that. I never suggested that. It was all about privacy issues regarding and liability uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the tax returns. I stated earlier, the Economic Development Commission on its application that it's, it sent to UHY advisors for, uh, you know, for consideration had on there that they should be disclosing tax returns at some point so that we can determine, as has been stated earlier, not just revenue losses, but impact on profitability. Um, and I will go and lastly just say, uh, in that same uh, COVID document, small businesses that were impacted by the pandemic are those that experienced decreased revenue or gross receipts. That isn't, that is the way it is stated in the application. We certainly understand that decreased revenue or gross receipts is not a singular methodology to determine financial impact. You know, we're, we understand that stuff, trust me. But it is one of several things mentioned in the application. So I will, I will admit that the application has, um, you know, we have a little work to do on it. And I think we brought up some great discussion topics for UHY advisors. But I wanted to clarify present versus past and present is my interpretation, uh, and I think it's relatively clear in the document. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm going to read from a prepared statement. I appreciate the time. Um, and this is going to sound a little tough, but we are dealing in a severely portion of our community. Um, with that said, my utmost respect goes to Maria for her profound leadership. All subcommittees for their tireless dedication to the ARPA grant issue, so important to this community. I, I personally really appreciate the amount of time that we dissect on this thing. There are some of the things funding municipal brick and mortars with this money is responsible. This is the easy way out. You think we can always look at that building or project with a sense of accomplishment, knowing that you voted to pay for it with money from the upper grant. However, how would you feel if after passing the building, you had five gravestones or 15, all with your name associated with them? Would you have the appropriate feeling of let down or despair because you forgot your call? as a public servant and let those people die from a lack of services. At a time when mental health and illness are at an all time high, linked directly to the pandemic, when threats to individuals and families are at an all time high, whether it comes from the form of seemingly non-threatening smoking, clean vaping, vaping heightened by cartridges filled with cannabis, THC or worse, Opioid substance use disorder, heroin, fentanyl, and endless contamination in street drugs, alcohol available freely in most homes, or simple anxiety caused by growing up in today's world. And what about the threat of youth gun violence at an all time high? Not the public mass shootings we hear about that grab headlines, but the everyday mishaps, injuries, and deaths at an all-time high. These are real. An all-time high, they happen in the most quiet of times. And we have an opportunity to do something about it in our town. The subcommittee has come up with a reasonable balance, distributing money in a way that attacks these problems, and uses the money the way the grant intended. Let's hope the whole council supports the subcommittee, allows us some tools to reinforce those that are helping this community, 
giving away a round Pandora's box of challenge, and giving this community a chance to be clean, safe, and happy. And I think it's been done. Thank you. Um, coming back to any other uh, comments from the public uh, about the, the drafts or the next steps or how fast we should move or not. Uh, back to the council, uh, we need some sort of, I was gonna use the word motion, but I didn't mean it necessarily in the parliamentary procedure sense. We need some sort of movement forward. Um, are people looking to move this recommendation to the council? Do we wanna do that and meet again next week? Do we wanna not move it forward? Do we wanna meet next week? Do we wanna um, flush out the next phase as uh, Mike Radinsky was talking about? Like and some sort of feedback from, from counselors, um, Councillor Allenson. Um, I'd like to propose that we move forward with what we have so far to the full council and gain their insights on whether they want full documentation included in the application process, um, because ultimately we aren't going to be able to do anything without the nine counselors anyways. Um, my opinion personally is my opinion but i'm only one of nine so um i would like to propose that it seems like we've reached a point where there might be one more decision that needs to be made in regards to how many people like how many employees we want to include in the application but I think that for the most part, we have a good foundation where we are. Um, and we have a couple of questions that we really need answered. And um, I, don't, I don't know if we're gonna resolve those here without weigh in from the, without weigh in from the full group. So, I mean, I would I would propose that we bring this forth to to them for their feedback and say that and, and let them know what the sticking points are, basically. Thanks, Councillor Testa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I don't disagree with Councillor Allenson. I think it's a discussion that we need to have with the full council right now. I did have one question. Um, I forgot to bring it up earlier. And I think you may have touched on this, uh, Mr. Chairman, but does it seem like um, when someone gets this application and submits it, do they, is it reasonable that they would expect that they'll be approved if they meet the criteria of the that's in the application? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's a step we're gonna have to make sure we're really on board with. I think a lot of people have been, I mean, they've been, you know, businesses downtown and little areas, they, they've been talking for months about, you know, there's gonna be applications and you'll be able to submit it and get some money. And they've just been waiting for the applications. Now the yeah. application. The application is going to come out, and is there anything in there that says, "Oh, by the way, you may not get approved if you meet all of these criteria"? So I, I think we have to keep that in the back of our head. But I think it's a good time to to bring what we've worked on so far to the full council and get their feedback. Um, because obviously nothing can happen without full council votes, and um. It's clear that to do this properly, it needs to be done incrementally. And we're at that point right now. So I'm all in favor of sending it along, what we have so far, and seeing how they feel about it. Okay. Yeah, no, um, I don't, I think when you, when any nonprofit or when I work for a nonprofit, when we apply for grant money or anything, 
um, we're aware of a ceiling. In this case, it might be $13 million. Um, you don't put in for the whole thing. Even, even if there are limitations on each application, let's say $5,000, you put in for 5,000 because that's the most and you see what you can get and then you get a thousand, you're happy. Um, I don't, I think, I mean, if we need a preamble, an explanation that um, just because you meet all the standards doesn't mean you're gonna get everything you asked for, then that we should put that in there. Um, but I don't wanna, slow it down anymore either like what you're saying i think i think we just need to move to the next step so that some of the organizations that are ready to roll right now can get going and uh and it doesn't mean that we this is right we have until what you know 2024 um it doesn't mean we have to give it all out in three months but um there's probably organizations as the coalition was just talking about that um that we could get this out now and start helping people well i think we we have not certainly determined um, uh, approval criteria, if you will, you know, what we're going to consider as approval criteria. Uh, but if these applications go out without something that says, uh, I'm not trying to be trite and flip here, but the as it is now, the application is going out there, but they need to know that, oh, by the way, we just may decide not to approve it. And if we don't have something in there that says there will be uh, further uh, work done or a delineation of some sort of criteria that's going to be applied, uh, at the very least, we're opening ourselves up for potential legal challenges because this is government money, it is a government project, it is a, and um, if there's even a whiff that um, Joe got his money and uh, Peter did not, and there's no clear reason why, uh, we could be in a lot of trouble. So we, we, something has to be in there that says uh, there's no guarantee and or whatever, you know, come up with something, <laughs> some kind of disclaimer, some kind of information that says uh, nothing's set up yet. We're really just gathering information. We're trying to determine the need. Whether or not we are able to satisfy your, your application remains to be seen. And the criteria by which we will make that decision have not been established. Um, so just a, a little bit of a warning there, I think. So Is do you a, think then that we should say if you lost X amount and you're requesting Y amount, you get Z amount? Like it's an it's an equation. Like I'm trying to understand that. I guess what defining the criteria. We're down the road. We're not ready for that. But I don't think we're there. That'd be fab, that'd be fantastic. But we're not there. I'm sorry, I'm chewing on jelly bean. I apologize. We're so, not there. So, so then let me I, wait. Yeah, let me. At this point, we're just trying to determine ascertain need. And whether or not we're able to satisfy you, we can't say yet. This is not a an, this is not a you know, this is not an application that is saying if you meet all these things in, in the beginning of this, you're gonna get your money. Something right. has to say that may not be the case, or they'll have every reason to expect they're going to get their money. Right. And we're going to have to be explaining why did I not approve your business when I approved their business? Or why did I say no to anybody in the first place? I never said what the criteria for saying no was were. Criteria. Do you want to develop the the judgment call? I guess that the, that the second phase would do. You want to develop that in black and white before we send out the applications or while the applications appear on the portal to determine whether an organization or entity qualifies? No, I don't think we have time for that. We're not prepared for that. Well, we that, that I'm just, yeah, because that, no, I mean, that's originally we were, but then it sounded like no, you're I, saying, oh, I think we gotta, we have a, for lack of a better word, putting on there, we need to have a disclaimer that says the criteria is TBD. I mean, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's coming, we haven't established it, but this is a need assessment. This is not an, a be all end all application right. because we can, we're not gonna be able to come up with those criteria in another meeting. So that's moving along way too quick. Well, I, I, I think that's a consultant would have the answer for that too, right? Yeah, I just think we need to put something in there that lets everybody know your application is not a guarantee simply because you met all the criteria. 
a simple statement. Let the legal people write it up. There's something that has to be in there that says that. Or I think I think it's unfair for the applicants, and it's certainly going to put us in a very difficult situation. We haven't even decided how much, you know, if if the only thing we put in there is, well, you know, you're not going to get your money if we run out. And I, we, get, we have to be, be a little more specific than that. I agree. Uh, and that's only right and fair to all, all the people of any organization and or individual or whatever that is is hoping to get something out of this. We're not there yet. Let them know we're not there yet. Um, I, I share Councillor Tata's um, trepidation, if you will, about the applications in the first place. But I respect the argument that it's good to have an idea of what the need is. Okay, fine. That's what I'm. That's why I'm okay with the applications going out. Only, I'm not in favor of these applications going out under the guise that that's it. Oh, so I agree. It, well, we've got to say that because everybody, the only people, only people that really know what we're doing are the ones in the the Brady Bunch Square here. Everyone else is reading a small piece on the, in the paper. The average person is going to is going to, I think, anticipate or expect something different. And I just don't want us to set ourselves up for, you know, more headaches than we are clearly going to have. That's it. Great. Thank you. Disclaimer, disclaimer. Uh, Councilor Zandri, did you want to say anything um, in China? No. No, I, I was just basically going to say that, you know, I'm kind of in support of moving this along to, to the full council. That was really all I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, Mr. Berdinsky, you've, you've posted comments. You want them part of the record or you're going to melt the sign off with the sign off you've done? Uh, no, maybe I, maybe I will. Um, give me a 45 second bell. We don't have commercial breaks here. No yeah. sponsor. Yeah, as you can see from um, my chat, we have one chance to do it right. After after you start down a wrong path and try to patch it up with fixes afterwards, it doesn't have the same sense of gravitas. Um, and I think uh, showing the public um, that we do have time to be thoughtful and deliberative, and we do have time to talk about criteria, and we do have time to explain why tax returns and documentation is important. I think that's worth 30 days. And I don't think, you know, and I think that that's plenty of time to do it. I agree. The key, the key is maintaining the public trust so that no one comes, you don't read a article one day, months from now, um, written by Devin, if he's still here, that says multimillionaire gets 250,000 ARPA grant. Uh, you don't want to read that. Maybe you do. I, actually, I shouldn't speak for you. Maybe you do want to read that. But reading that article is the path you're walking towards right now. And it's going to be very hard to correct unless there's something very definitive and clear that you're going to do whatever is necessary, appropriate, and proper to call out struggling businesses from businesses that are not struggling. Uh, a quick comment to Tim Ryan. Good point, Tim, uh, if you're still there. I think, yes, you are still there. Good point. There is further language uh, about okay, if you want to, you can pass, you can consider past losses and send someone a check for two hundred thousand, and that'll go into that stock portfolio of that business owner. Is that what you want? So it's a choice that needs to be made, and you can do it in thirty days. Don't don't rush this too quick. I think one or more counselors are suggesting that you can pick this up again at a council meeting and, and address these inadequacies. I hope that's what. I'm sensing in their in their comments. Thanks, and again, thanks for your patience, everybody. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we do. Um, again, I don't even. I mean, I can I can be rushed by the April 30th deadline if, if that becomes the end all be all. But um, I I know people. There's a need out there, um, functionally, operationally. Um, we have the time, and, and I do want to make sure that we we do it right. So the discussion right now, uh, without a motion currently on the table, um, would be to, to move at least the draft application parts forward so that they are ready for the next council meeting. Um, is there somebody that wants to make a motion for that recommendation? Councilor Allenson. 
Most, uh, so moved. Moved, is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded by Councilor Zandri. Uh, yeah. For clarification, that includes all the amendments we originally included. Uh, it is, is it your intention to include the 60 person cap on the employment and the 2020? Um, I think I think we need to discuss it. So, exactly. okay. You, well, I mean, you, I think we, we can move changes. forward to the full council and then we can always make changes there too. Right. Right, exactly. Um, I would just note, I would note that in the document that it's been suggested to maybe to cap it somewhere um, because of the requirements of under 500 employees. I mean, I don't know how many businesses we have in town that have over 500 employees, but um, that's... Well, the cap was 60, if you wanted. No, I know, but I'm saying like... It, it, the cap would be the it, it's just based on the recommendation i think that i personally i think 60 is fine but um like i i don't really i think i would like to hear the opinions of others to understand what that implications is right, so the intention of your motion is to leave it as it is now for the full council leave it as it is now for the full council and then um you know we'll discuss the recommended tweaks so far um as we go all right great any other discussion from the counselors before we go to a vote so just clarification for me so are we are we going to bring it forward to the full council with the recommendation of 60 and with the recommendation of including the 2020 or just as it's written right now he as says written. as recommended that's from all motion right. you want to amend our motion to amend um no i'll no because i'm i'm comfortable bringing it up at the full council meeting that yeah. that i think we should bring it up so i mean we'll, we'll move it forward as it is and we'll we'll just dis, we'll discuss it there because like i said i i mean yeah i'm kind of in agreement that maybe it doesn't go to 500 but i don't know why to me 60 is arbitrary 70 is 70 is arbitrary i don't think we need a number i think the only number we really need is the maximum number that the guidelines require, which is 500, and let people come forward. But I mean, that's just me. So. Or the, the consideration afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that's just me. So. Sure. All right, seeing no other comments from the counselors, uh, Madam Clerk, can you please call a vote? Allenson. Yes. Laughing. Yes. Tata. No. Testa. Yes. Zandri. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three, and uh, it's the catch all, but I'm going to bring in do we want to meet before the next council meeting in preparation of the consultant coming? to discuss the criteria at which judgments will be made or do you want to wait until we're just full-blown we've had enough discussion you feel like we're going to go and bring it up to the consultant when when he's there and talk about it then or do you feel we need to meet again next tuesday after ordinance or whatever um to talk more to have something from a committee I mean, we always kind of talk about this point, getting to this point anyway, uh, but it's been a big discussion tonight. So I'm just curious where everybody then wants to go oh, at the will of the, the subcommittee. <clears throat> does anybody, sorry, I'll. That's right, no, Councilor Allen. Does, any, does anybody have acceptance criteria in mind? No. No, I, I, I mean, my, my take on it might my, be to bring it up with the consultant in two weeks. I would, I would think, I think we should bring it up with a consultant in two weeks because I think we're going to need a little bit of guidance on um, where to go. Although I do like the not profit, not for profit, um, you know, allocation criteria, um, perhaps along the same scale like when we get to that point but 
what's the acceptance criteria for the initial application? I don't know that we can answer that without some answers to these other uh, questions. So okay. I would say, let's just wait until after we meet with the consultant. Any other counselors have a question or comment? I see nodding. Any other members from the public? Final words on tonight before we go to the, the next meeting. No. All right. Um, so we'll adjourn this meeting. The recommendation to have the full council review the drafts with a consultant for possible approval, denial, or amendment will occur in the next council meeting, second Tuesday in April, where we will also discuss with a consultant as a full council the criteria at which everything should be judged. Um, I'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night.